Hello and welcome to Always Bored Never Boring. We have made it, the final video in my series dissecting my review copy of Against the Ogre Horde, the newest expansion for Avalon Hill's new edition of HeroQuest. And this is where we dive deep into spoilers. I am going to go through each mission in the 10 part campaign in considerable detail. That means this video is for Zargon players only. If you think you are going to play through against the Ogre Horde as a hero, I do recommend you switch this video off right now or else you are going to ruin your enjoyment of the expansion. With that warning out of the way, let's begin. The plot of Against the Ogre Horde is incredibly simple, and it really leans into that Saturday morning cartoon trope where the recurring baddie hatches another scheme to beat the goodies, usually involving some villain of the week or powerful never heard of before but absolutely threatening to all life MacGuffin. In this particular case, Zargon has been up to no good, convincing a reclusive clan of ogres to join his forces. The heroes need to put a stop to this plan as quickly as possible, but there's one problem. They have no idea where the ogre's lair is. All is not lost, however. The Master of Battles at the World's End Tournament can help them. But if they want her assistance, they are first going to have to prove their might by becoming champions in her vicious gladiatorial games, and then they have to defeat her too. Let's just hope she doesn't take a leaf out of Red Sonja's Guide to Romance. The tournament section of the quest comprises three missions. These are entirely new missions created especially for this edition of the expansion. If you don't want to play them, you don't have to. The rules say that if you are only interested in playing through the original Ogre Horde questline as it was presented back in the 1990 edition of the expansion, you can skip straight to Quest 4 and get stuck in from there. But if you do that, you are going to miss out on a new Hero Quest experience, one that is quite fun and which I have already discussed in detail in a previous video. The heroes arrive at the tournament and are immediately thrown into the gauntlet, one mission in which the heroes will face three waves of enemies in the arena. After defeating each wave, the next wave immediately spawns and the mission continues. Any trophies or chests that were claimed are not replenished. First, the heroes face Scutter Rat and the Bruisers, a cheeky goblin and his four orc bodyguards. These are followed by Death's Chosen, two zombies and two skeletons led by a dread warrior. Finally, the heroes face the Spawn of the Pit, a superpowered abomination with the profile move 6, attack 4, defend 3, body 4 and mind 3. The fun thing here is the spawn of the pit uses the new multi-phase rules. If the heroes reduce the beast to 0 body points, it isn't destroyed. Instead, it goes into a blind rage, becoming faster and stronger but also more reckless. It has a new profile of move 10, attack 5, defend 1, body 6, mind 1. If the heroes defeat the second phase of the spawn, they have finally destroyed it and completed the gauntlet. But their trials aren't over yet. Quest 2, Proven Worthy, is a single bout in the arena. This time the heroes are facing Doralf, the reigning tournament champion. This is a straightforward dust up. Doralf is an ogre represented by the extra large ogre commander miniature. He has the profile attack 6, defend 5, move 6, body 7 and mind 3. Do a number on him and it is straight onto quest 3, Glory and Gold. Grusbella, the master of battle who runs the tournament, has decided you are worthy champions and she is willing to help you, but only if you can defeat her in a final bout in the arena. And this I really like. Grusbella is a multi-phase monster with three separate profiles. You have to knock her down three times to win. At the start of the fight she is Grusbella the Confident, Attack 4, Defend 6, Move 5, Body 5, Mind 4. Reduce her to 0 body points and she becomes Grusbella the Determined. Attack 5, Defend 5, Move 7, Body 5, Mind 4. Knock her down again and she becomes Grusbella the Reckless. Attack 6, Defend 1, Move 8, Body 5, Mind 4. Defeat her again and you will have finally earned her respect and her help. But that's not all. Grusbella also has three special abilities that she can use once each throughout the contest. There is Break, which lets her immediately end the effects of a spell cast on her. There is Resilience, which lets her ignore all damage from one attack. And there is Deflect, which lets her redirect an attack against her onto any hero within the 10 squares surrounding her. This is really fun and combined with the multi-phase rules makes Grusbella feel like a real boss fight. This is certainly something I would like to see more of. 
enemies with a range of abilities and techniques that will really test the heroes. Sadly, the designers at Avalon Hill do have a tendency to come up with really cool ideas and then never use them again, treating them as isolated incidents never to be repeated. I mean, this concept of multi-phase monsters with special abilities doesn't even occur again within this quest pack. It doesn't bode well for seeing its implementation in other quests down the line. And yes, that does mean that your final battle with the Ogre Lord towards the end of this quest isn't going to be half as exciting as your battle against Grosbella, which is a real shame. Anyway, if the heroes win, Grosbella will tell them where the Ogre Clan is hiding, and this leads to Quest 4, infiltrating the Fortress of the Ogres. This is what would have been Mission 1 in the original Ogre Horde expansion from back in 1990, and from this point on, we are treading familiar, perhaps too familiar, ground. Because to be clear, from this point, Avalon Hill have basically copy and pasted the original Ogre Horde missions. Map layouts, trap locations, furniture, monsters, sometimes even treasure is almost identically presented. And I really don't think that was the best idea. Against the Ogre Horde was originally designed for the European rule set, where, with the exception of ogres and a few named villains, almost every monster only had a single body point. I do feel there is a risk some of the missions are going to be too challenging, or simply too much of a slog, without the tweaks to the layouts and rules that I was expecting to see. But to be fair, Avalon Hill have done some modifications to the quest to make things easier. First of all, in the original edition, heroes were not allowed to buy equipment between the adventures. This restriction is not specified anywhere that I could see in the new rules, so a kind Zargon may decide the heroes have found a friendly ogre on their journeys who is prepared to barter for goods. Additionally, Grosbella has smuggled some supply crates into certain maps. These crates each contain four healing potions, which I think are going to be essential pickups for the gang. There are a few instances of additional treasures being added to some rooms. For example, in the first quest, in the room marked A on the map, the heroes will find a crossbow, two potions of healing and 200 gold, all extra bonuses that weren't there in the original version. Finally, it's now possible to hire an ogre mercenary, giving the heroes some additional muscle for the tougher challenges. Regardless, the heroes are thrown into the thick of it with this adventure, where they must explore the caverns to find the entrance to the ogre's lair. They start on the large outdoor tile, which is supposed to be a single space. Do note, in my copy the outdoor tile does not have a grid on it, but I know many people have received copies of the expansion where the tile does have a grid. I think this may have been a change made between production runs, but I'm not sure. Either way, and despite the outdoor tile having a grid in the original Ogre Horde expansion as well, the grid is wrong. That tile is supposed to represent one big starting space. There are a few things to note in Quest 4. We have our first instance of a swinging blade trap. When activated, it slices through all the indicated tiles, hitting anything there with two combat dice. We also get our first Pit of Darkness. They are much deeper than a regular pit trap, and if you fall down one you take more damage the more heavily armoured you are. This damage ranges from 1 to 3 body points, depending on exactly how you are equipped. This is a change from the original Pit of Darkness rules, where the amount of armour you were carrying determined how many combat dice you rolled to take damage, with unarmoured characters rolling one dice, and the most heavily armoured characters rolling three dice. Also of note, one room in this map contains orcs that are described as skilled combatants that can attack diagonally. This is a bit of a shame, because in the original expansion they were described as orcs carrying spears. I would have loved to have some miniatures of orcs with spears to represent this new foe. However, as there are 6 orcs in just this one room, which would require 6 new miniatures, and being as orcs with spears don't appear anywhere else in the quest, I do understand why Avalon Hill didn't bother. Finally, there is a magical effigy of an orc in one corner of the dungeon. It spits out fireballs each turn, but is unable to move and is immune to spells. Always neat to see a new type of enemy or hazard turning up in quests. Overall though, this is a pretty straightforward mission. Find the iron door at the top left of the board, and then go straight on to quest 5, Beyond the Gate. The aim in this quest is to find the ogre's war room and disrupt their raiding plans. This is achieved by going to the central room, clearing out the monsters, and making sure no more monsters enter the room for one full turn. Having done that, the heroes can escape by finding the exit on the bottom edge of the board. 
not too much of note here. There is one secret door that will automatically open when a hero stands on the pressure pad beside it, which will then immediately spawn a room of orcs. Other than that, there is just one room I want to draw attention to. Now, if you saw my review of the druid character, you will remember I discussed the pixie spell. That spell can either heal two body points of damage or else reveal all the traps and secret doors in one location the druid can see. I said in my review that I think it's almost always going to be the case that the spell is used for healing. Healing is always useful, but it would be uncommon to need a spell to reveal traps. This room, this one right here, is the exception, because here the pixie would be very useful. You have an ogre champion and two orc archers with a row of traps in front of them. Hang back, and the orcs are going to ping you at range. Charge in, and you are going headfirst into those pits. You can't search the room because there are monsters, but you cannot attempt to jump a pit that hasn't been discovered or triggered, even if you have guessed it's there. So, the druid could, in this case, cast Pixie to reveal the location of the traps. Then, the heroes could leap across and get stuck into the fighting. So, I will hold my hands up, while I still maintain that in the vast majority of cases, the Pixie is going to serve better as a healing spell, this is a specific situation where you may indeed have to use the Pixie's ability to spot traps. Honestly though, this room layout is gross. In the original edition, there were three clear spaces on the other side of the pit traps, because the Ogre Champion only took up a single space. With the new Double Space Wide Boy Champion, there are now only two empty spaces on the other side of the pits, so any heroes leaping across are going to have a much tougher time. Furthermore, because of the American line of sight rules, which are different to the European line of sight rules, heroes that do jump across the pit are going to block any ranged attacks other heroes hanging back might wish to make against those enemies. It just becomes a really obnoxious room to deal with. What I, as a professional Zargon player, would call a dickish layout. The heroes would be better off bypassing this room completely. Thankfully, that is possible. Quest 6 is the Lair of the Ogre Horde. Two things of note here. Firstly, if there is a hero in any of the central passages on Zargon's turn, they have to roll a dice. On the roll of a 1 or 2, the central room is activated and all the monsters in there come out to play. The other thing of note is that this mission includes an Apprentice Dread Sorcerer, which Zargon has installed in the clan to help control the ogres and get them to do his bidding. This Dread Sorcerer has the exact same stats as the stats from the original version of the expansion. That means he has one body point. One. The Sorcerer has the Mind Burst spell, but don't be surprised if he doesn't live long enough to use it. Unfortunately, we also have more examples of dickish layouts here. Far too many traps on the other side of doors. I have never approved of that particular dirty little trick. Quest 7 is the Tumultuous Halls, which was originally called the Carrion Halls. I guess Avalon Hill decided that name was a bit too gross, because these are the feasting halls where the ogres gather to eat. There really isn't much to say about this level, it's a straightforward gauntlet. Lots of traps, and lots of monsters. We have more dickish layouts with rooms that have traps positioned directly behind the doors, and there are lots of winding routes that all end up going to the same place while offering very little in rewards. This one really does look like a bit of a slog. Just look at the lower left of the map. Three Dread Warriors, immediately followed by three Dread Warriors and an Ogre, immediately followed by three Dread Warriors and an Ogre, immediately followed by three Abominations. <laughs> Oh, and I should mention, I really would have appreciated a bit more clarity with the iconography for ranged enemies. Look at these goblins. I would say it's pretty easy to miss they are supposed to be archers. But, if the heroes survive that ordeal, and frankly Zargon may need to tweak things a bit to prevent the heroes getting destroyed, you move on to Quest 8, the Pit of Dread, which uses that cool new map overlay with the fiery pit in the middle of it. This is actually the only level that makes use of new map overlays with special rules. I really do hope that Avalon Hill starts to lean more into map tiles with new rules, it really does help to liven up dungeons and add new challenges. The first special room your heroes may encounter is the Bottomless Abyss. Any hero that moves onto the Abyss instantly dies. So, you know, don't move onto the Abyss. Avalon Hill could probably have done something a bit more exciting with those rules. Moving on, we have the centerpiece of this dungeon, the Pit of Dread. Any hero who moves onto the pit and does not move out on their very next turn is consumed by dread and lost forever. 
This is a particular concern because the Dread Pit is home to the Dread Sorcerer Festral, who can cast the Dominate spell and force heroes to walk into the pit and stay there. Hidden in this particular dungeon is Festral's Ring of Power. The heroes need to find it and throw it into the pit before they can leave. HeroQuest does love a Lord of the Rings reference. The next quest is Fortress of the Ogre Lord, and once again it is almost exactly the same layout as the original version of this dungeon, which is, again, a little bit weird, because we find Festral's assistant Zenloth in one of the rooms. His stats have been ported over directly from the original version of the mission, so he gets just one body point, and as he is in a room all by himself, I don't think the heroes will have to worry too much about any dread spells being cast on them. The other thing of note in this mission is the heroes finally encounter the big bad himself, Ecker the Ogre Lord. They must defeat him before they are allowed to leave this dungeon by the spiral staircase. And the final battle will be tough. Ecker is accompanied by his commander, a champion and a regular ogre. Thankfully, this is a slight modification compared to the original version where Ecker was accompanied by the commander, a champion and two regular ogres. But this is, frankly, a bit of a ridiculous fight. Each enemy has a defence ranging from 4 to 6, and between them they have 27 body points. At first blush, it looks like it's going to be a drawn out affair, a bit of a slugging match. With 4 heroes and 4 monsters, 3 of which cover 2 spaces each, plus a fireplace and a massive throne, there isn't going to be much room to move. Each monster is going to absorb massive damage, and none of the monsters have any special skills to break things up or add any interesting tactics. The ogres are pretty much just going to stand there rolling dice. In an expansion that introduced the idea of multi-phase enemies, bosses with special skills, and trophies for dice mitigation, it's hard not to feel like this is not the epic final confrontation we could have had. But if you can wear down Ecker and defeat him, you move on to quest 10. The alarm has been raised, and the heroes must flee. They need to make it back to the surface before they are overrun by the enemies hunting them down. This is actually a really exciting idea, and it's not the first time we have seen it in a Hero Quest mission, although it is implemented in a different way here. The heroes start on the stairway and must find the outdoor tile to escape. The rules state that on each Zargon turn, Zargon is allowed to roll a dice. On a 1 to 5, he can activate all the monsters in one room, even if it hasn't been revealed, and on a 6, he can activate all the monsters in two rooms. Additionally, on each turn after the heroes leave the room containing the stairway tile, Zargon can spawn three orcs on the stairs to chase them. Personally, I think this is not a great idea. It was an idea designed for a game where the monsters have one body point, where heroes could charge through a room of enemies with relative ease. Just look at the first room next to the entrance zone. One ogre, two abominations. In the original edition of this expansion, you are looking at an ogre with four body points and two femurs with one body point each. But in modern Hero Quest, that ogre has five body points and those abominations have two each. That's a not inconsiderable challenge that could easily take multiple turns to wade through. Multiple turns in which three orcs are spawning right next door. And this is a long, winding dungeon. If Zargon can reveal all the rooms before the heroes get there, he can easily choke the escape points and create a devastating bottleneck where the heroes are slowly chewed to death by the inexorable green horde piling in behind them. Even if the heroes can survive it, I think this is going to be a very long, slow mission, where heroes creep forwards one space at a time as more and more enemies are fed into the grinder. It is a really exciting idea. We have seen the run and gun missions before and they are great, but this implementation is questionable. I think Zargon players are going to have to do some modifications to this mission on the fly to make it a really compelling experience for everyone. And I feel I could say that about the whole quest. Overall, this is a very faithful recreation of the original Against the Ogre Horde questline. Almost everything is the same. On the one hand, that's very cool, because Avalon Hill chose not to interfere with an old classic. There is a show of respect there that is admirable, and I do understand the desire to leave as few fingerprints as possible on a classic. On the other hand, a bit more interference probably would have been good. A lot of monsters are tougher in this version of the game than they were in the original European edition. Many have more body points, and they will take a more concerted effort to take down. That's not something to be taken lightly. It's something that should be factored into every dungeon layout, every set piece, 
every trap and every treasure drop. Furthermore, each ogre in the new edition has its own body points, but in the original, all the ogres in a dungeon shared a single body point tracker. If you've never seen this system in action, it's a bit weird, but it does add some tactical play to skirmishes with ogres. Let's look at the tracker from the Fortress of the Ogre Horde level. You can see it has little checkboxes, and some of those boxes have skulls inside them. Whenever you inflict body point damage on an ogre, any ogre, you check off a box on the tracker. If that box has a skull in it, the ogre dies. That happens even if it's the first time you hit that particular ogre. So, let's say my Barbarian hits an ogre for two body points of damage. I would mark off these two boxes. Then, the Dwarf hits a different ogre for two body points. The third box is a skull, so the Dwarf kills the ogre. However, the second body point of damage he inflicted is not recorded. The next time an ogre takes damage, we cross off the next box after the skull, and so on. Yes, this is odd, but it does, in a slightly abstract way, represent a clan of ogres fighting as a team. You hurt one of them, you hurt all of them. You kill an ogre and you weaken the whole clan. Now, in the original Fortress of the Ogre Lord mission, there are 10 ogres, including the Ogre Lord. The Ogre Lord does not have his own body points value, it's five, but every other ogre shares that one body point track. No matter which ogre you attack, excluding the Lord, you are chipping away at that total. It's possible to manipulate the fight, attacking a weaker ogre first to knock off a few body points before landing a killing blow on your strongest opponent. Not only do our new ogres have more body points, but those body points are now tracked independently, so you can't soften up that commander by punching the regular ogre a few times first. Each ogre becomes its own wall to break your hands on. So I think you get the point. The Against the Ogre Horde quest expansion really did something new for the European edition of HeroQuest back in 1990. It introduced the kind of monsters fans had never seen before, really strong monsters with lots of body points and a completely new game mechanism for tracking those body points. It considerably boosted the challenge and added new traps, and it encouraged all the heroes to work together. But this is the eighth quest expansion for Avalon Hill's edition of HeroQuest, and at this point, with the original Ogre rule stripped out, it's hard not to feel like these adventures are leaning far too heavily on traps and massive quantities of tough monsters to slowly grind down the heroes. Admittedly, as I said previously, some small changes were made for the sake of balance, and I will concede that many of the enemies in these missions are orcs and goblins, and they only have one body point regardless of which version of the rules you play with. But even so, I really would have liked to see some new set pieces that put the heroes in exciting predicaments. Some new rules that made ogres more interesting than just big bad guys with lots of body points. Fresh mission layouts more considerately rebalanced for the American rules, and a more complete and cohesive integration of the cool new ideas like multi-phase enemies. Against the Ogre Horde is a great expansion, and I don't want my video to make it sound like it isn't. It's an impressive and generous amount of new content. It adds lots of new ideas into the mix, gives us lots of cool new enemies, a new hero, a new game mode, it gives and gives. And I truly believe the intention with the questline itself wasn't to cut any corners. It was a considered attempt to give fans the original Against the Ogre Horde experience. That is a noble goal, and this quest will be fun. It will be fun to revisit for nostalgia, and it will be fun just as a hero quest mission in its own right. But I think it needs a little tweaking along the way. It's a square peg for a really big round hole. It fits, but there are gaps around the edges. Oh, and I suppose I should tell you, if the heroes escape, Grusbella decides she's going to knock some heads together within the clan and encourage them to make a better choice when selecting a new lord. It's the beginning of a new age of peace and the first steps in forming an alliance with the ogre clans that will ensure Zargon can't use them again in the future. What that future will bring, we will have to wait and see, because that really is it from me for now. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please consider pressing the like button. If you really like this video, please consider subscribing if you don't already do so. And hopefully, I will see you all again very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.